Today we're going to be taking a look at getting one of the lesser known computers from the 80s working, a Coleco Atom. This project is sponsored by PCBWay, but we'll take a closer look at that later. The Atom was released in 1983 as Coleco's first and only entry into the home computer market. However, the Atom is significantly derived from the ColecoVision game system released in 1978. So much so that its full title is the ColecoVision Family Computer System. And the Atom was available as an add-on for the ColecoVision that would plug into its front expansion interface. The Atom was designed so similarly to the Vision that it's even able to play the same cartridges using the same controller, albeit cast in white this time. However, don't think that the Atom is just a simple reskin of the Vision. Where the Vision allows you to store your controllers, the Atom has internal upgrade slots that allows you to expand the memory from the built-in 64 kilobytes and two cassette bays that can be installed. Let's actually talk about that cassette drive a little bit, because it is one of the more interesting aspects of the Atom, as well as the most significant issue. It is not surprising that this computer from 1983 would use cassettes for software. That was extremely common at the time. However, Coleco decided to make the cassette format for the Atom proprietary. With a cursory glance, the Atom Digital Data Pack doesn't seem all that different from the Philips Compact cassette, but these are not able to be used interchangeably. Side B on the compact cassette is identical to side A. However, side B on the digital data pack has holes cut in the top. These holes are meant to prevent you from being able to put in a standard compact cassette in your Coleco Atom. Additionally, the compact cassette has four sets of holes at the bottom. The outer holes are used to pinch the tape to allow it to be pulled through. The Atom does not use these holes and only has two on the bottom. This means that the Atom Digital Data Pack cannot be put into a standard compact cassette player. Okay, so why not drill holes in your standard compact cassette then and try and stuff it into the Atom? Well, this right here is why. Pre-formatted. Coleco Atom Data Packs are hard sectored. They have a track marking embedded in the tape that keeps the data bits aligned with where they are supposed to be. Much like how modern high capacity tape drives work today. This means that pre-formatting is vitally important. If a magnet were to get near your cassette, not only would it wipe out your data, but it would also wipe out those hard sectors, rendering the tape useless. Unfortunately, the Atom was also not a well-designed machine. It was found on startup that the computer emitted an electromagnetic pulse that would erase tapes in the drives. This would also happen if the tapes were stored too close to the printer. So later units had the sticker applied warning you not to leave your cassettes in the computer when you turn it on. Speaking of turning it on, why don't we do that now? Well, there's a reason. I'm missing perhaps the most important peripheral for this system, the printer. The Coleco Atom was only available as an incredibly large box set that included the computer, the keyboard, two joysticks, and the printer. Now because the Atom would always include the necessarily large and bulky printer just because of the physical dimensions of paper, they thought it would be a good idea to integrate the power supply into it. This means without the printer, you cannot power the Coleco Atom. Because of this, it is not uncommon to find Atoms such as mine orphaned from their printers and unusable. But I don't think that this should be the death sentence that it inevitably is, and today I'm going to design a new power supply usable with the Coleco Atom. Now thankfully, there is a large crossover between vintage computer enthusiasts and electrical engineering enthusiasts, and someone was able to get a hold of the original schematics for the Coleco Atom and publish them online. And looking at what I believe is the power supply connector, we can see that we have minus five, minus 12, plus five, and the other typical voltages found in an ATX power supply. And looking around online, I'm not the only one who's thought of this, as there are power supplies that have been modified to have a DB9 connector to plug into the Atom. However, I feel there is room for optimization here, and longtime viewers of my channel probably know where I'm going with this. I created a similar power supply adapter for the IBM PC Junior, and am going to take a lot of those design elements and apply it here, making a power supply that can be attached to the side of the Coleco Atom and run it off of 12 volts DC using a Pico PSU. 
However, before I go firing up KiCad and designing a board for this thing, there are a couple of things I need to verify. I need to open it up and confirm that the power port is in fact J9, and that that is the correct pinout for it, and that the negative power supply requirements are not too great for a Pico PSU, especially since the cassette drives are integrated into the system. I can see over here these wires running from this board with the connector come over to here and then are labeled by color, not by voltage, but we have J9 back here. And if I continuity test this J9, I can see that it goes over to the DB9 connector on the side. All right, now going back and referencing that schematic, I can confirm the pinout. The pin eight on here is in fact ground. Pin five also connects to ground. Those two are shorted here. So I'm sure if I go around and find uh, chips, I could find that the five volts, 12 volts, negative five volts all go to where you would expect them to go. So I can confirm the pinout of this port as well as the functionality of it. So that's good. Now, I need to spend a bit of time staring at the schematics before I can be totally sure that I can actually power this device off of a Pico PSU. But before that, seeing this empty space in here gives me an idea. I could make the ATX power supply adapter internal. But for now, let me go peruse the schematic and see if I can figure out where all it looks like just negative 5 volts, because even though this looks like a negative 12, it's obviously positive 12. So it looks like there is no negative 12, which uh, I can't remember. Is there actually negative 5 on the uh, ATX spec? <laughs> hmm. Nope, it is not. So I'm going to have to go ahead and create my own negative 5 volt power supply. Great. Well, looking more closely at the schematic, I'm not really sure where the negative 5 volt rail connects because it is really low resolution and it's hard to tell the difference between a positive 5 volt rail and a negative 5 volt rail. Thankfully, the Atom Technical Reference Manual tells you what the absolute maximum power draw can be, and it needs to be able to power 200 milliamps on the negative 5 volt rail. The negative 12 volt rail on the Pico PSU is only 50 milliamps, and I don't like my chances of using something like an LM7905 to step that down. It's probably not going to be able to deliver enough current. So I'm going to have to put on my own inverting voltage regulator, and honestly if I'm going that far, I might as well do a 5 volt regulator as well because the Pico PSU would only be contributing 5 volts at that point. So ultimately I guess my board is going to take a 12 volt input directly and output a positive 5 and negative 5 volt rail alongside passing through the 12 volts. That should give me all of the voltages I need for the Coleco Atom, and as long as you use, say, about a 3 amp 12 volt power supply with the regulators I'm choosing, it should be able to power it just fine. Now, let's get on to laying out the schematic and circuit board. Okay, the Atom internal power supply is complete. Uh, I am just about ready to order this. I just need to do one final check for things on the board, um, just to make sure that everything is looking good. Now that the board design is finally finished, I can go ahead and order PCBs. And since PCBWay is sponsoring this video, I'm going to go ahead and do that with them. But that's not the only reason. I've actually used PCBWay for professional boards I've designed in the past, and their boards have always turned out great. So the first thing I'm going to need to do here is put in my board dimensions, and mine is about 79 by 61. 
and I'm going to get a quantity of 10 because they have a prototyping discount for a order of 10 boards that gets you a lot better of a deal. If I change this to say 15, it jumps up quite a bit. They uh, want to do prototyping orders like this because they have uh, panels that they'll run in quantities of 10 and it works out really well for everybody to do that. Um, then you can do different board options, uh, like the layer thickness of the uh, fiberglass stack up of uh, I think it's called the prepreg. So yeah, there's a lot of options. Um, I'm going to order mine in blue because I like that for prototype boards. Enig would be cool, but it really raises the price up. Uh, one thing I noticed is their assembly service charge is uh, actually really low. So I'm getting 10 boards right now. I'd put in 10 boards. Um, I have 23 SMD parts on here. Uh, unique parts would be the DB9 connector, the uh, barrel jack connector, all that stuff. I can just do that as uh, hand soldering when the parts arrive. And if I calculate how much that would add, it's really not that much. $30 charge to get assembled boards. And I actually, you bump up into free shipping with this, okay? We take that away we get free shipping so it adds almost no cost it's 13 dollars extra to get 10 assembled boards now if you're ordering more boards the price break is even better but uh yeah that's a really good deal for the uh pcb assembly cost i am going to solder this by hand though because i want to check the different stages as i populate the board uh, but that's it for now. I'm going to go ahead and order my boards. After you place the order, uh, you'll be taken to a page where you can upload your Gerbers, and then they get approved and the manufacturing starts. So let's check back in a bit when I get my parts and the boards. All right, getting back to this a little bit later, and I have my boards from PCBWay and parts from DigiKey. I ended up going with DigiKey because there were some other things I needed for different projects that I can only find on DigiKey. So... There we go. But let's go ahead and take a look at the boards. I have already opened this up and been in here. And it seems like PCBWA is celebrating uh, five years of being in business. And they've included some little goodies. I'm not sure if everyone's getting those or if that's because this is a sponsored video. But cool. And here we go. The boards. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the circuit boards. They seem like they're pretty darn good to me um this is a slight mistake that is my part um i made a spelling error on there thought i'd corrected it the correct way with the footprint but it duplicated that so that's my fault um but elsewise everything else looks really good i'm pretty happy with how this little thing turned out on there uh yeah everything seems fine there are just a couple of little design flaws that are my fault uh, like, I didn't pay attention to how thick the touch points on, are on here, and I was hoping you could run wires through those um, and manually install this with soldering if you really wanted to. But, uh, oh well. Um, right here, the cable is actually internally going to plug in on the uh, board so that the uh, device can be installed inside of the Atom. If you don't have a uh, actual standalone Atom and you have the expansion module number three, you'll be able to put a extension on here. They make uh, serial through extensions, male on one side, female on the other. Um, and then you can stick this on the side of the unit. I would not recommend using a extension cable just on the off chance that it's a null modem cable because that will actually switch the 12 volt and 5 volt lines. That's those are the ones that are switched on this and that would that would do nasty things to your atom. So you don't want to do that. <clears throat> But, uh, okay, let's take a look at how this is going to work. So the first area on the board is this right here. This is the power input. So there is a 5.5 millimeter barrel jack that will go on there, and you will plug a 12 volt power supply into this. There is a MOSFET on here that will be controlled by this switch. I wanted to avoid going with a really expensive switch on this kit, unlike the uh, PC Junior kit. So I went with one that was a lower capability. It's meant to have this cap on it but it looks like i didn't take into account the board size and the cap doesn't really fit well anyway despite being designed for this series of switch so that's that's frustrating um so that's how that works uh this was an idea i had i don't really like the 
concept of antiquating the printers entirely. So we'll be able to put a pin header there and then take a serial uh, header like you'd put on a motherboard and plug this in right there and then dangle this out of the side of the case and then you should be able to use the printer still. So this just passes through the data and reset lines on here. All right, the rest of this is divided up above the negative five volt regulator and down below. Both of these are buck switch mode power supplies. Now I've never laid out switch mode power supplies before, so this is kind of new and exciting and scary to me. I'm, I have no idea if these are gonna work yet. Um, so this one um, should be able to deliver, I think it's, yeah, five amps on the positive voltage side. That's way more than enough. I think it needs two and three quarters at most. Um, and then the negative side can deliver at one amp, so that's five times as much as it needs. So this should be good as long as it ends up working. Um, this is actually just a regular uh, buck converter here, and I'm using it in an inverting way. It's kind of strange. It's apparently really easy to make an inverting buck converter circuit. So uh, I'm curious if that's going to work at all. So, uh, but... Outside of that, everything else looks good, so I'm looking forward to assembling one of these. Actually, I should see how it fits first, and, uh, hmm, I may have messed that up a little bit. All right, I put the screws in there. The fit's a little close to the edge on uh, there, um, but the power jack, for the most part, will fit in there, but it's at a little bit of an angle. Uh, if I, let me grab another one here, if I extend out this on this side, then this will fit just fine, it really won't be an issue. So there's nothing over there, it's just ground plane and stuff. So uh, yeah, on even these prototype boards, I could fix that by just nipping out a little bit there and then scooting this over a tad. Oh yeah, there we go. I have a lot more wiggle room with the board now, I and mean, that's what I originally wanted. So. All right, that's the power switch circuit installed. Now I have this wire hooked up to the uh, power input for the barrel jack. This is the exact same pinout. Um, this way I can connect this to my bench power supply off to the side and not need to risk shorting out my uh, big high amperage uh, 12 volt power supply because when that goes south, it's gonna go really, really south. All right, there we go. On at 11.5 and off at just a handful of millivolts. I replaced R4, which was 10K, with a 1K resistor, uh, so the pull-down effect is much greater, and that seems to have solved the problem. I guess 10K was just not enough. All right, so the power switch is a success. So now for the next part, and I don't know why I even thought about making it a question, I wanna do the negative five volt power section next, because I really have no idea if that's actually going to work or not. So. Let's find out. It's a lot of little parts to put on there to just take a guess and see if it'll work, but let's do it. Yep, ooh, that's a good looking inductor on there. That turned out perfect. I'm super happy with that. Wow, that looks really good. This is gonna be all slick when it's done, if it works. If it doesn't work, well, ah, that'll suck. I am getting 19 millivolts out of it. Uh, 20, that's not good. All right, the problem was something I had suspected, but couldn't find any real strong evidence about one way or the other before laying out the board. I should have really accounted for this in the layout, but oh well, at least it was a pretty simple bodge wire. The enable resistor for the uh, buck regulator was tied to ground, which is technically in a way high for a negative voltage regulator, but it needed to be tied to the in. But I am now, generating five volts negative DC. Oh yeah. Um, just for the record though, cleaning this was incredibly important or else the, um, 
the bootstrap signal, the frequency the that does the looping doesn't really get through all that well. All right, now if you're curious, here's the output ripple and the uh, frequency of the output. Um, that seems really low to me. I'll have to go back and look at the data sheet to see approximately what this should be. Um, but I'm getting about 50 millivolts. This is 10 millivolts uh, div per division here for the uh, uh, output ripple. That's not bad. That's about what you'd expect. Um, I haven't tried loading this yet, so I'm not sure how it's going to respond to that. But I'll do that after I'm getting closer to uh, putting this in the computer. But for now, I'm pretty happy with a 50 millivolt uh, ripple. I completely spaced on one aspect of this design, and it's a slightly big problem. Um, the thermal pad for the uh, 5 volt regulator has um, vias through it, and I was going to put the soldering iron on the other side to heat those, but no, because I forgot to put a mask relief on this side so I could touch it with the iron. So it's going to be really complicated to try and heat that up. Actually, I have a potential alternative solution if I remove some of the solder mask going away from this, I should be able to apply heat on the top side and have it flow underneath the part. All right, let's see how well this works. This is going to be very strange. That'll have to be good enough. <laughs> I can go back and pop it with the uh, heat gun from the other side, but now I can work on this. All right, and there we go. There is the five volt output. This is after a rigorous cleaning. The entire board has been cleaned. And uh, I'd say that's pretty good. That's a really low ripple voltage there. Um, again, this is 10 millivolts per division. So that looks like about 10 millivolts total of uh, ripple. Again, unloaded though. And we are getting five volts out perfectly. Okay, load testing this is um, slightly annoying because I don't have a programmable load. But I have a couple of things that aren't bad here. So let's start off by powering a Raspberry Pi from this. So uh, I have, <clears throat> let's start this out here. The Fluke uh, 287 running a current uh, sense through there, all right. The 34401A measuring the voltage and the oscilloscope measuring ripple AC. So. We can see the pies pull in about 60 milliamps. It's really not all that much. Okay, let's step it up to the next most hungry device. This weird Chinese cheap power supply. And we're getting 100 milliamps current draw. It's holding around ugh, four. Man, that's bouncing around all over the place. I didn't notice that the first time. Next largest load. See how that stays consistent here. Um, a bigger battery bank and this one is consistently 200 milliamps that is all over um, huh the ripples pretty good but let's get to the last one that draws the most current and has the worst ripple by far this rechargeable Logitech G 700 s mouse and if we turn this on get 320 milliamps current draw this is a uh, really bad ripple we got about 50 millivolts of ripple here and voltage is going down quite a bit there so that's great next let me try the negative 5 volt rail i'm just going to swap the two power connections coming off of the board here because theoretically that should be exactly the same that should be capable of delivering an amp so we'll see how that goes. I'm going to go ahead and summarize the negative 5 volt rail test in post here because the USB cable I was using for all this wasn't in the best of shape and it was changing the results. And the ripple changed significantly with load for the negative 5 volt rail. So we'll take a look at it again later. Well, okay. Uh, I think this is validated enough that it's time to stick it in the atom and see what happens. I don't even know if my atom works yet. Okay. Here we go. I'm gonna plug in power. I have no power light on this. I guess I could have done that. Um, okay, it should be off. And uh, I guess it's not. 
Oh, it was in the open. That was working. Dude. It works. It's not great. Um, I'm connecting to the monitor. Oh, oh, there we go. It works. The power supply works. The atom works. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, after a bit more testing, I can say for uh, rather certain that the atom is working. Um, I am just really shocked and thrilled about this. So, uh, yeah, this kind of really rocks here. Uh, I'm not sure if this controller is fully functional. I don't have a lot of a vision experience. Do you have to push both buttons to activate? Because that's what it's taking. Um, maybe I'm just pushing one rather hard because I'm pinching more, but anyway, yeah, this is, uh, pretty much working now. So, I don't have sound connected in any way. Ah, no, there we go. So, alright. That was just one button. But, uh, this is feeling pretty darn good here. So, I need to resolve that power button issue because I don't know what's going on there. Ah, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, let's get started on that. It's clearly working. It just is also not really working. That should be off right now, actually, but it's not. Welcome to the next day, and I'm still trying to troubleshoot the power button, and I just figured it out. All right, so here I have cut a trace on the board between the barrel jack and the MOSFET so I could verify that the current was actually flowing through. The switch is in the on position up here. It's negative, just disregard that. We're flowing 45 milliamps through, which, side note, this thing's running on almost no current at all right now. Anyway, turn it off, off, zero milliamps. Now, it's pretty low current, but it's not running on nothing. Well, here we can see this light, all right? That's running just fine. And I put that light there because we need to see when the unit turns off, when there's no screen, because that's the problem. If I unplug the monitor, the LED turned off. I am not going to plug it back in because I did it once and there were sparks. The power supply I'm using is somewhat of the culprit. Here I have my Fluke 287 off to the side in continuity mode. All right. Barrel jack on the power supply. Third pin ground. It's grounded. Hmm. Those of you who know how not to fry your oscilloscope know where this is going. Ground on the uh, power, three prong power cable going to the barrel on the monitor. Also, ground. So, it's conducting DC ground through the video input. So, yeah, the switch actually is working. Um, if I weren't using this power supply and I were using an isolated two amp power supply, let's just say, I probably have one around here, but you know the idea. It's just one of the wallboard type ones, not a big beastly one like this. Um, it would have worked normally, so it was actually a good thing I was using this power supply because it um, demonstrated a potential flaw in this design. I must switch to high side switching for this because this is, this is a, I'm not going to be able to fix this. There's just no way. So, uh, yeah, the switch does work, but it goes through the video port. So, that's an interesting development. Okay, let's uh, give it power. All right, now actually, this <laughs> my 12 volt power supply has a fail mode here uh, for some reason. Here is actually this. Here's the ripple coming out of that right now. Um, so there's 50 millivolts, 200 mill millivolts of ripple. Um, if I unplug it and plug it back in, bam, 50 millivolts of ripple. That's a lot better, though my 12 volt power supply kind of sucks. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> So this is without the tape drives, uh, no controllers, no cartridge, no keyboard, anything connected to this. So this should be um, a, a medium size load for this. So the uh, positive five volt rail is five volts solid and pretty solid negative five volts. Okay, let's look at the ripple on these. So negative five is, uh, let's see, it's dropped us down to 10 millivolts. That's 
about 20 millivolts per division here so we're getting about uh 80 millivolts of ripple that's not tremendous um that's a very interesting curve there too but uh i think this is about the maximum uh it's gonna draw for negative i don't think it's gonna change all that much let's check out five volts five volts that's it's rock solid that one's not having any problems at all that one has a little bit better filtering on it um i could probably add a couple more filter caps to this it may need just more bulk output i don't know yeah i think i'm going to try putting the keyboard and tape drives in here well tape drive i only have the one and see how it does then and see if i can load a uh, cassette basic i don't even know if that cassette's good because these can toast it on startup if you leave it in there but let's see okay this is just going to be straight up power on test uh to see what happens so here we go didn't seem to try and access a tape drive but it may have some kind of well i think it does actually have tape detect um let me throw the basic cassette in there and see what happens when i reset computer all right smart basic and that cassette's not doing great in there i need to stop it that poor cassette i'm pretty sure it wasn't like that when i put it in there great okay after much careful finessing it is rewound so i'm going to go ahead and close it off and put all the screws back in how in the world did that happen okay i'm not taking any chances and i rewound that sucker by hand so all right here we go let's try this again it's actually on the spool this time that is terrifying whoa it's supposed to be super fast um wow yeah it didn't seem very successful okay i have no idea i think i have one more program buck rogers was the pack in i can try loading that and we can see super game pack all right let's uh this has to rewind how do you rewind these in the atom i mean there's got to be a way is it going to detect that it's at the end, automatically rewind it, and then do it again? I don't know. Let's, uh, I'm going to start this. And while it's doing that, I'm going to check the manual. Yeah, I just rewound it, actually. Well, at least that's fancy. So, okay, then I don't... Oh, rock. It's working! Sweet! So my basic cassette's toast. Awesome. Of course it is. But hey, that means that the cassette drive works with the power supply. So I'll take this as a win nonetheless. It's uh, disappointing that this is toast, but I think there might still be some of these out there. So I'll just need to try and track one down. All right, then. Actually, you know what? I'm going to load Buck Rogers one more time, and I'm going to have the uh, multimeter set to measure the min and max of uh, all the voltages it reads. That way I can see if there is a voltage spike that is significant on 12 volts uh, when it stops running the motor because it's supposed to have a separate inductive load and I don't know how bad that actually is. So let's see. Well, I didn't see anything, but it's also possible the spikes happen so quickly that it's just very difficult to see. Um, I'll probably just put the flyback diode on there uh, for all of the ones that I ship out, but it may or may not be necessary. It's really low cost for a peace of mind, so it's, it's worth it. One final test here is I'm getting ready to button this thing up and call it done. The power supply working 
outside of the computer as it would have to be used with an expansion module 3. This is very, very finicky. Um, this is really, I'm going to unplug this from this end actually. This is really crammed up against there. Uh, you would uh, want the extension, the DB9 extension that I mentioned to get enough clearance for that. You could probably, if you bought this as a kit, I'm not sure if I'm going to offer this as a kit yet. Um, it, it could be possible to uh, extend this out by not putting it all the way flush to the board, but then if you used it internally, it would be uh, a lot more prone to cracking the solder pads during install. So, yeah. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up the first revision here of the Coleco Atom internal power supply. I'm not going to be shipping out these boards as is. I think that the uh, low side switching was just too bad of an idea. I've actually already started working on a second revision that has high side switching, and I will be getting those boards produced soon and ordering new parts to replace the end channel FETs that I should not have purchased in the first place. But overall, I'm very, very happy with how this project has turned out. I mean, I have a functional Coleco Atom now, and I don't have to have a giant printer hanging off the side. The power supply ripple voltages seem pretty reasonable to me. Um, I have on the second revision put uh, additional filter caps on the negative 5 volt rail, and I tested it on this one, and it about halved the ripple voltage on it. So that's going to be a big improvement. I also changed some of the physical location of them on here to a more suitable point. So it should be overall much better on the second revision, and it was already not too bad on this one. One more thing, uh, the power supply cap that didn't fit should have been correct. I was actually right. The company that makes these, eSwitch, um, has a series called LC, and these are a part of it, and that switch is a part of it. And even on their own website, they say it's a part of it, but not all parts in that series are compatible. So what's the point of having that be a series? They need to break it up into different series. So anyway, um, I don't know what I'm going to do uh, to replace those. I will probably will just super glue these on. I kind of like this switch, but I'm also thinking about getting a smaller plunger cap so I don't have to uh, route out around the switch because it's really difficult to route next to the power jack, which I also move forward. Actually, on the new board, uh, I, I know I'll cover the new changes when those get in here. I've been working on this video for nearly a month now, so <laughs> this one really needs to wrap up. Um, but one more thing before we go. I do really want to say thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video, and I genuinely mean that. Uh, it's really helping out uh, with getting these parts made. This was a much, much more expensive kit than the ATX to PC Junior ever was, um, just because this is a real proper circuit design, so I'm very grateful for that. But that's it for now. Stay tuned for the update on this, which will be much, much shorter. This video has turned out incredibly long, but that's not surprising considering how I showed everything. <laughs> so uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, I do more stuff like this. If you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. I'll see you next time.